if some if somebody goes it goes into this training uh, say a white person who has very strongly anti-racist views then they're likely to be convinced by a d'angelo style of training that it is virtuous for them to believe that they have white supremacist views they are asked to accept mm. that they believe black people to be inferior <laughs> Excited to be joined by the one, the only, Helen Pluckrose, the incredible woman um, who I think is pretty much one of the founders of the critique of uh, critical social justice, quote unquote woke. And um, there's lots of different uh, t terms for it. Um, but I'm just, I'm hugely honoured uh, to be joined. Um, by you, Helen Pluckrow. So firstly, thank you so much for, for coming on the pod. Well, that's, that's, that's very, very kind of you, and, and Naya. I, I, I've, been, I've been watching what the Equiano Project has, has been doing, and, 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 and yeah, uh, we, we'll be in a mutual admiration society here because you, you're, just, you're just going from strength <laughs> to strength, aren't you? It's wonderful. Oh, that's very kind. For all of those people who have been living under a rock, um, Helen Pluckrose is a British author um, and cultural writer. So she's best known for um, the criticisms that she's written and her explanations of uh, critical social justice. Um, one was the book that she co-authored with James Lindsay in 2020 called Cynical Theories, which was essentially um, uh, the Bible for many um, people that essentially emerged very soon after, trying to understand uh, what this new uh, identity, race, gender, sexuality um, obsession was happening within the culture and, and what we should do about it. But also she was part of the Grievance Studies Affair uh, and that was with uh, Peter Boghossian and James Lindsay, which was essentially submitting um, a series of papers um, in the uh, critical theory uh, section of academia. And many of those papers were hoaxes but they were ultimately published and many of them commended. And, and the purpose of the affair was to really show that the level of um, academic rigor and scholarship in many parts of uh, uh, the humanities and, and other areas of academic life were, were, were being eroded and it was very effective in, in raising awareness of that. But I'm sure we're gonna dive um, into all of these um, issues as we uh, go on in the pod. So I guess the first question I wanna ask you, Helen, is, is how did you come to participate in that debate because uh, correct me if I'm wrong but your your background is medieval history is is that correct yes. it, it is yes yeah, I, so, um, what? I, I I've also <laughs> um, very strongly been an empiricist um you know I I, mm. I believe in evidence-based uh, epistemology I, I want us to study things rigorously um make sure that what we are accepting as true is is um grounded in um reality and um so as a looking at I I specifically looked at late medieval women's religious writing and so because of that, I, I consider myself essentially a, fe a feminist historian. I wanted to look at women's experiences, but I found that there were only certain ways I was allowed to do that. And so I, you know, I, I, it, was, it was problematic if I did not use particular theories. Um, I was... Um, suggested that, that that it was sexist for me to to say that evolution by natural selection exists i i i used, i wrote one essay which included a considerable amount of evidence that um color based racism is a modern form of tribalism that it did it was you know we've, we've always been tribal but until the beginning of the 17th century um transatlantically it was not a colour um, related thing. And I, I cited a lot of, of sources for this and a lot of studies which show that we are we are not hardwired to recognise race in the same way that we are sex and age. It's been useful for millions of years for us to recognise the sex and age of other people. We don't have a thing to recognise race. We haven't needed it. Race is too new. And that, I was told, even though it was true and I could evidence it, um, I, I mustn't write that because I, I should imagine how black communities in America would feel. And this is not how we do history. 
So, yeah, I, I, it was the postmodern theories and the identity-based conclusions that I was supposed to come to that were causing me a problem and stopped me from doing my PhD. And at the same time, my, my feminism was being overtaken by intersectional approaches, which I felt at the time were particularly failing Muslim women. And so it, it all came to a head and I, I started writing essays and, and tweets and then it just seemed like a load of people just came up to watch me doing that and then asking me to write for them. And um, yes, that, then, then it went from there. Oh, amazing. So, I mean, that's... So when you were experiencing that, I mean, what, how did that really manifest itself, though? So did it, what, was it that um, uh, professors or was it other people that were working, um, it, 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 doing their PhDs? How did it really manifest itself, that, that kind of pressure? Because I think that's one of the things that's very interesting in the discussion when people still, all of these years on, try and uh, essentially deny that these things are going on because they'll say well actually that no platforming is, is very rare but oftentimes it, it's it's these subtle oh, yeah. ways that make you just feel that maybe this is going to lead to social ostracization or i'm going to be marked down so what, what what were those ways more specifically and, and where I, was it coming I, I from? just i just wouldn't have passed so in in my undergraduate mm. degree i um that there, there was a a module on postmodernism in which we had to do a postmodern analysis and I asked for my own intellectual integrity that I could do a critique of postmodernism. Um before so I and so I, I I essentially wrote an introduction um to my postmodern reading which um was a long winded way of saying everything I about to say is bollocks. And um that I mean it it, it got a good a good a, the, you know, it it wasn't a bad grade. It was, it was still just the first, but it was the lowest grade I got. But I was allowed to drop that one. And um, in my my um, my masters, my attempt to um, address um, sort of I, um, had identity issues in in relation to a fellow. That essay got the lowest um by, by about fifteen twenty points, and it, it was quite clear if I carried on suggesting that biology is real um that race actually that racism actually isn't an inherent thing to humans uh, or and and that sex is there there are differences between men and women i i just wasn't going to pass so that's that's how i think a lot of us find our way out my 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 daughter too my adopted daughter who's of indian heritage she um found she she left after her master's because she simply couldn't do cultural anthropology in the way um it she she needed to be because of all the all the theories around it she was she was even told as an indian woman that her attitude was colonialist and it just, it oh, just God, I, I, I've, I've had that as a black woman <laughs> as well <laughs> it's uh, yeah so I, that, I, that's I know exactly people, how that feels that pe people end up writing things they don't believe in, in order to get through their studies. Then I, I have a a new book where I'm I'm sort of have, have practical advice for people um, with dealing with critical social justice in the workplace at university, and one of the modes that we suggest is, is stealth. Sometimes people have to lie in their papers. They have to provide what is given because that's a a conundrum, a, a moral dilemma that people come to me with, uh, which is that if I write what I I really think is ethical, I'm not going to pass. And, you know, it's more important for people who don't hold these beliefs to become, be able to become teachers, counsellors, psychologists, than to be weeded out. So we've had people um, have, the, you know, changing their theses, pretending essentially or or finding ways to around things way to, to ways to avoid saying anything that that will really annoy anybody and then they feel able to to practice um their you know it, it's mostly psychologists and teachers then they are able to actually become take on those jobs and um apply their their liberal um anti-racist principles to their their work Sorry, that was so, long-winded. So you, no, 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 not at all. I think that this is really important, and you're and you're talking about 
all the different ways in which this ideology is is affects people is still affecting people in multiple areas of public life but mm. on the point about so you were you, you had these experiences you started writing your profile started to to um increase then how then how did the grievance studies affect come about because because there's, there's a lot of people that might have these experiences at university but um, they, ne- they don't necessarily take action they never and they don't necessarily take that kind of action so how did well, at what point did you feel that th- we need to actually act and we need to really expose this i i i came into to that in a sort of gradual process so i um mm. a bit because of of all my years in of studying a theory um of, of various kinds i was first of all a red flag catcher so um uh, james and peter w- would send me their papers and i w- and i would i would read through for for anything w- which stood out as not in keeping with the theory and and likely to you know to be kicked out and then i i started writing more of the theory into the papers and then writing my own papers and that was, I, I think that, that the purpose of that was to show the problem to exist. Because a lot of people say it's, it's only a few mad papers, and there have always been these mad papers. But if, if you look, every single one of our citations is genuine, and they really say what we say they say. And there are, there are hundreds of them. And I think in a in a different field like medicine, which actually is having its own problems at the moment, it wouldn't be acceptable to say, well, a, a, you know, a, a, a few bad papers, and only a certain percentage of bad medical advice is, is going into practice. Um, there's also some good stuff out there, and I think social justice, as they call it, or you know, just general consistent liberal principles, as I would call it, are very very important. So if you're acting on on bad information, on on theorised understandings of how society works that aren't rooted in reality, that is a serious problem. So we wanted to write papers that were indistinguishable. So so it's not really a hoax, because they were indistinguishable from from other other papers. It it was more getting inside, seeing how the system worked, citing people, just just trying, trying to show that it was there. So that and then cynical theories was explaining the problem with the the, the theories and um, counterweight and my my work since has been addressing on a practical level people being hit by the theories in their their places of work or their universities. But I've, I've been focusing particularly on on workplaces. No, so no, that's really. I mean, that that shows just such a great kind of thread in your work that from exposing it to explaining it to actually trying to practically resolve it. On that point about, so let let's go to to cynical theories and the book. And you know, it was you know it did incredibly well. I think it um, you know it really shaped the conversation. Um, for for those who don't know, just very briefly, how if, if it's quite difficult to because I think you know it it. it it's such a um, in-depth and interesting book, but how would you just summarise what the the thesis of the book is? So uh, we um, traced uh, sort of working backwards, um, really. We 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 go back to the the evolution of postmodern thought, and the two principles: the the knowledge principle that objective truth is is um, is unobtainable, and um, um, the the political principle that knowledge is the construct of power. So I'm I'm simplifying, of course, and then the the, the repeated themes of blurring, of boundaries, of um, cultural relativism, standpoint epistemology, which um, is is when you assume that people with the same identities have the same opinions, same values, and how how this came about, how it evolved. So we we argued that. The, the first wave just deconstructed everything. Um, and then in the 90s, when critical race theory, queer theory and all the others arose, they said, well, we can't just keep deconstructing things. We need to start reconstructing them. So then there was an activist agenda and it crossed into the mainstream, became accessible to the public. And then around 2010, it got very much more simplified and... Um, 
and and dogmatic and it it um was very 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 easy to have a pop version of it i mean understanding somebody like d'angelo is very different to understanding somebody like derrida and it's so and this now we, we we've gone from this deconstruction of meta narratives to a new single meta narrative which holds that society is uh, is run the way that power works in society is by assigning knowledge the certain people are considered to have legitimate knowledge these are dominant groups in society largely straight white men and their knowledge gets legitimized as true and we are, we accept this uncritically and then we perpetuate things like white supremacy patriarchy cisphobe transphobia homophobia in the ways we talk about things so we need to interrupt those discourses and change the way we talk about things to stop those power dynamics that's a very simplified root of the theories yeah so we will uh link the book in the description but also a video where um where there's many online of, of helen and explaining it um, in in a lot more uh, depth but i guess the reason i really wanted to speak to you helen is that a lot has happened, you know, since that book has been released. And as I said, it was and continues to be very influential. And I guess I wanted to get your thoughts on um, the several different things that have sprung up in response to um, critical social justice, woke, etc. And so I, I guess I want to take them piece by piece. One of the things that's become very interesting um, as a Brit watching the American discussion, and I think that that's very, uh, it, it, it's one that's very illuminating and for a whole range of reasons, is the backlash against uh, quote unquote critical race theory. And I wanted to know what you thought about that, because I, because you're, you're a liberal, um, and I guess a lot of the uh, criticism or attack on critical race theory has primarily uh, come from the right. So we've seen this in, uh, you know, the discussions that's what's going on in schools and institutions and the rise of figures like Christopher Rufo and others who I think some of the people that originally were critiquing uh, critical social justice like yourselves would not necessarily, you wouldn't see yourselves as, uh, you're not a conservative, you wouldn't necessarily see that, um, I, don't, I don't know, I don't want to put words in your mouth, do, do you, how, how do you feel about that? Because do, do you, because some people would actually think that it was some of the ideas and cynical theories that laid the basis for the um, conflict over critical race theory that's raging in America right now. And I don't know how, if, if you think that that's a good thing or you're quite concerned about that. Mm, I, I think I think cynical theories and other writings that of of, of mine and, and some of my colleagues have have definitely um, contributed to criticisms of of critical race theory or what being pedantic I I would now call contemporary critical theories of race, um, you know which have moved into cultural studies and become much simpler. So yeah, if if you want to um, accuse me of, of of arming people to um critique approaches to anti-racism which i find essentializing and illiberal then feel free to do that what my worry about the backlash is is that it's not um it's not coming back at the the theories i mean a, a backlash which said these ideas are bad and and took aim at the ideas um, on the level of ideas I'm I'm very much in support of. What is concerning me, and I, I've just written an, an essay about it uh, about this pendulum swinging back and forth, is that as and, and this is something we write in cynical theories. If if it carries on with the critical social justice attacking certain groups of people, though some of those people are going to backlash and they're not going to um, attack the the um, the theories, they're going to attack people. So anti-woke can then become anti-woman, anti-black, anti-LGBT and there's all these innocent bystanders getting um, getting hit by this this backlash, a rise of white identity politics um, arise a very strong sentiment against um, lesbian, gay, 
um, bisexual and, and transgender or transsexual people who we, we can put in a, a, a slightly different category um, as, as uh, many um, lesbian, gay and bi people don't uh, think it's a similar issue but it, the principle um, is the same that people who are not ascribing to these views at all are being hit by the backlash to them and this this is this is what worries me particularly i've seen in the uk a, a, a rise of um of white identity politics i i i, I spoke about it um uh, a while back this 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 idea um growing among certain groups of um you know that to be british it, it is to be white and 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 this is i think that that's always been um, a white identity politics has always been the basis of t typical racism, but I think there's now a reactive um, form as well, um, which is, um, well, they started it, and, and who's they? Um, we're, we're looking at a number of, of, of theorists and activists, mostly middle class white people, and you're suggesting the problem is black people. Uh, this is what I'm seeing uh, a lot of, and it, it worries me. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think you're really right there, Helen, and, you know, I've definitely um, seen a rise in white identity politics. I see a lot of stuff that, where, like, for example, Notting Hill Carnival, and people will say, and in some of the problems around the carnival, people will say that this is a kind of inevitable result of diversity, um, and all these kinds of ideas. And I do think that the, the, the way in which identity and racial identity has become a much wider part of the debate, has um, create, created an opportunity for people to essentially uh, garner support for white identity. And, and, I, and in a way, what's quite strange is that I think a lot of the uh, critical race theorists, in a sense that they kind of wanted that, they want white people to see themselves as white. And, and, it's, and it's quite twisted because that's actually laying the groundwork and contributing to a lot of white people seeing white white people as a distinct group with its own distinct interests that are separate from other ethnic minority people. I've just finished um, researching and writing my my final chapter, which is looking at the the impact of um, unconscious bias uh, training, um, I have equity, diversity, and inclusion training, and that that supports very much what you um, ha have just said. It it so profoundly doesn't work it re-entrenches um stereotypes if somebody um doesn't have if some if somebody goes it goes into this training uh say a white person who has very strongly anti-racist views then they're likely to be convinced by a d'angelo style of training that it is virtuous for them to believe that they have white supremacist views. They are asked to accept mm -hmm. that they believe black people to be inferior. Now, I don't see a difference between convincing yourself to believe um, this and, and actually believing it. The, this is, the people are there, therefore being essentially trained to be racist, whereas other people going into, um, I, I cite all this in my, my new book, but um, other people going into this, this training who do hold um, some racist ideas that they they have some shame about are likely to come out of the the training feeling somewhat justified because the D'Angelo style is it, this isn't about being good or bad racism is inevitable it's unconscious you can't help it and they think oh well can't help it then you know this is this is normal they f they then feel more right in their views Whereas people of racial minority coming out of, of these, thing, these groups then tend to assess the level of racism and um, prejudice in, in society generally as considerably higher than they had previously believed it to be as a result of the training. So it, it's caused a, a considerable... I mean, the... It, and and I don't want to link the US and the UK. I mean, as, as um, Tommy well, Oelade's wonderful new book, This Is Not America, reminds us, we, we cannot um, simply compare these two countries, lump, lump them in together. We have different histories, different experiences. But the 
um, the the overall impact um, of it ha has just been uh, has has been found to be that the workplaces that do um, this kind of unconscious bias training have fewer um, employees who are black or of racial minority than those who don't do it. Mm. That's so interesting. That is, you know, I, I think as well, another example, as you were speaking, actually came to mind. I've actually seen a lot of increase online, particularly, but I think more broadly, in, in a race and IQ discussion. And I think, again, a lot of the uh, identity politics advocates have laid the groundwork for that. So they essentially say that um, the, only, the only reason for disparities is because um, it's because uh, of racism. And when and, and there's no other explanation, and there's other people like, of course, people uh, like yourself and I, and you know, the Saw report in, in the UK, which tried to say that actually there's lots of different reasons for racial disparities. It, whilst racism could be a factor, there's other factors as well. But I've heard a, a whole new group, um, still quite small, but trying to essentially say, well, the real reason racial disparities exist um, is because uh, black people are. Uh, less intelligent genetically or genetically inferior um, and I think that because, partly because of the way in which the discussion around trying to understand racial disparities has been so narrow and so binary again it's created the groundwork for people that essentially want to come up with their own explanation um, mm -hmm. their own catch-all explanation that makes sense of racial disparities so I think you know a few years down the line I, I, I think I've seen a lot more uh, the, the, some some parts, whilst there, some elements of the discussion have improved, I've seen a much uglier side that has come out from the fixation on racial identity. Yes, I mean th th this is is what I I've been hearing, and, and obviously that there's a selection bias with the people who come to me because nobody's coming to me to tell me that there isn't a problem with critical social justice in their workplace, but um, th this this attitude. That I mean, well, one month, um, sixty percent of the Brits who came um, to to counterweight to to talk about um, anti-racist training were black, and there's such a high, highly disproportionate number of black um, Brits, even even higher than um, South Asian Brits. South Asian Brits are also overrepresented, but black black Brits particularly. Um, really, so so many of them that, that I now have half a dozen template letters um, of, of people that say, please stop racialising me at work. Um, I don't want to be assumed that I agree with all the views of Ibram X. Kendi because of the colour of my skin. I don't want to have a racialised relationship with my with my colleagues. I I recently. In a, in a recent essay, I, I cited uh, one of the letters from a, a young um, a young guy in in which he said, um, you know, if you think because they were going through the the critical race theory then, but that um, that people that black people have a greater competence to speak about race and racism, listen to me when I am telling you that. Um, Calling all white people the race, um, ignorant, um, racist because of their colour of their skin, is not going to end well, and so it, I, it, I find it very frustrating when there are, are so many, um, you know, the uh, black and South Asian people pushing back at this. There are so many women pushing back at the demonisation of men. There are so many LGBT people opposing queer theory. And then when the backlash is coming from these indiscriminate groups, it's it's attacking people who are then who are natural allies who are also um, criticizing the same prejudiced um, essentialist narratives. Mm. So it's interesting. So you you've mentioned that a lot of the 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 number of um, ethnic minority LGB people and women that have um, started to criticise the excesses of a lot of the um, identity politics narrative. Um, but what's been quite, I don't, you know, we, we don't have to go into specific uh, people, but one of the things I think has transpired over the last couple of years has been, I guess, divides in um, the approach, and I touched upon it in the beginning um, when I mentioned the critical race theory backlash, but 
um, that divides in the approach amongst the people that were originally, um, you know, broadly united in, in their criticism. And so I'm thinking about, for example, how some people that were criticised the excesses of woke ended up embracing, uh, you know, Trump and Trumpism or, or, or other forms of uh, uh, right wing populism. Um, and others uh, took a very different approach. Um, well, and, and I, we even saw, I mean, you are I don't know if you saw yourself as part of the intellectual dark web, but some people would say that maybe you were adjacent to the intellectual dark web and how there's been, I don't know if you agree with that, Helen, would you, or, I mean, maybe it's not something you, you self, self identify with, but um, essentially what, what do you make of those divides that have emerged? Um, like Sam Harris, for example, is now, uh, yeah, obviously takes a very different line to others on on covid and and the vaccine and and i guess what the question i'm trying to ask is that um has the criticism of woke um which originally united a lot of people perhaps created the groundwork for um maybe conspiracism or more extreme views and that that we're kind of seeing now and how, how do you maintain that liberal line is is the long way of getting to that question i i think the problem a problem arises when you define yourself in opposition to something so we saw a similar divide in a few, a few years ago maybe a decade ago now in the atheist new atheist movement so uh, people defining themselves um you know as um generally not not only disbelieving in god but also being quite critical of religion that that was the the organization around it when you did it, define yourself as against something you're not necessarily going to have that much in common else in common with uh, with other people so if you define yourself as anti-woke I think it's very very important to um, also remember what you are pro so I am as I say pro-liberal and that is going to be the approach that I, I will take to things other people you, you, you can oppose wokeness for for all sorts of reasons ranging from um you know being extremely um uh, liberal and and opposed to um to to racism to having a strong christian belief in the um you know the 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 unity of of all people all all people all god's children you can have libertarian views you can have conservative um views people can come at being critical of wokeness for all sorts of reasons but some people i think who were united at first in criticising the authoritarianism of it, have themselves become authoritarian because they weren't liberal um, to begin with. They weren't. They, they they were using the language of freedom of speech and freedom of belief um, when they felt they were being denied it. When they feel that they have more of a voice, they would like to start banning books and. Um, and banning speakers and, and doing their own cancellations. So I, I, I think being, it, being anti, sometimes you have to oppose things. But when you're opposing something, be very, very sure what you are pro as well. So I, I would consider myself in alliance with those I would can call liberal conservatives. Um, and that that would be the, um, the the sort of typically people with typical conservative values um, uh, who also uh, have this sort of universal and individual approach to human human rights and um, and the ways to to address things. These we need to be pro liberal. <laughs> so so it's interesting that you say that, and I don't know if you've come across it very much, but there is this increasing movement. That I've been following very closely called post liberal, um, and it's essentially uh, people that say that uh, you know liberalism can see uh, you know has the seeds of its own destruction. That liberals are, are unable to defend their own values, um, and and uh, essentially that we need to use the power of the state to impose a moral order because part of the problem is that there's a crisis of meaning, and you know people are atomized. And communities lost, and liberal niceties of you know freedom of speech and discussion is not really providing the morality and purpose um, that people need. 
and that and we need to hear and so we need and so essentially what what do you say to those who say that actually it's the liberal tolerance of um all these kind of values of equality and universality um, that has got us into this mess actually what we need is um we need much more uh discipline we need order we need moral authority um and to some extent moral uh moral absolutism um in order to uh, essentially be able to withstand the various different new religions and new th- or authoritarians that are emerging. Th- does that make sense? Yes, I mean, I've, um, I- I've been following um, various um, post-liberal um, currents um, that-, that can be found in um, I think like the, um, the SDP and in, in Blue Labour, those who are describing themselves as conservative mm-hmm. Marxists, um, also on the, the right, um, those who who are more sort of um, traditional conservative, um, and and yeah, so I I see this um, this development, and and they have a lot of differences, but what they have in common is that they're kind of going back to the original critics of of postmodern of postmodern era. They who were saying we're becoming fragmented, where we've lost a sense of meaning. But they and they want to kind of refine this meaning. But what I I would have to answer to that, um, and I I wrote an an essay about it. You know, is what is liberalism the best way to beat woke wokeness? And the answer to that is it depends on what society you want to live in. If you want to live in one where you don't have to pretend to believe anything you don't believe in, you don't have to fear cancellation um, for saying the wrong thing, then you have to aim for a liberal society. There are other sort of growing movements that could potentially have more power to push out liberalism, but then we would likely find ourselves in a frying pan you know fire frying pan situation I mean, I don't want to be cancelled for criticizing the monarchy anymore than I want to be cancelled for criticizing critical social justice so I I would I would ask those people who I, I would say to them are you considering when you're thinking about liberalism and whether it is the best way to create a society that is that 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 is sound that is that is just are you using liberalism as a tool to get to something else or are you it or is liberalism the end goal and for for me and and and, and for liberals generally a liberal society is the end goal i mean you you make um, a solid point when you say well, there's the seeds of our own destruction there i i've always found the quote um, a liberal is someone who won't take their own side in an argument to be a particularly good one because of that level of tolerance but we have we have two choices really if if we if we want to to defeat authoritarianism we can either get more firmly liberal and just not and very strongly not tolerate um impositions uh, i mean it's there's nothing anti-liberal in saying no we are not going to let you institutionalize your ideology in the same way that we wouldn't let you institutionalize your christian faith say we wouldn't ask we wouldn't let you make everybody recite the apostles creed you shouldn't have to do a diversity equity inclusion statement so there's, it's perfectly liberal to put laws in place to say to defend that kind of freedom of belief and the other, because the the other, the only other um, possibility to more strongly defending liberalism, and I think that is the weakness. We have not defended liberalism strongly enough. We have not noticed when things are that are illiberal are getting power to deny other people freedom, or we can can go and pick something else which we think will will push wokeness out um better and and and, and get behind that and then wh- where are we where are we going to be and i this is what i ask people when they if they if they ask me do you really think liberalism can work wouldn't it be better to to try something else and they're usually talking about a form of social conservatism and i say well what would i have to pretend to believe in your 
new society what would um, I not be allowed to say in public what would prevent me from being employable if the answer is nothing you're still free to say and believe whatever you want then you're still looking for a liberal society you you just mm. <laughs> it, 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 it really is quite black and white yeah, I mean, maybe maybe they'll it's interesting maybe they'll say that they, they want to take what's good about liberalism and abandon all the things they don't want about it but I, I think you make a very good point Helen one of the things that just following on from the point that you make I think what I, I'm perhaps best known I don't know I'm maybe best known as a free speech advocate and I think that my views on free speech I've not actually said this yet to anyone but um but I, I think my views on free speech are I don't know if they're changing but I'm I'm questioning them sometimes because not not that I no longer believe in free speech but the question is that maybe uh, th- these questions uh, like John Stuart Mill emerged at a very particular time in history. And actually, when we look at some of the challenges that we face today, does do those do those principles still have universality? And this is not that I don't think that, but I think it's all always worth us rethinking why we believe what we believe. And a, an example to make it more concrete is that uh, and maybe this is too specific of an example, but um, obviously Elon Musk has taken over Twitter. And a lot of people on the kind of anti work side were very in favour of this. I, I was pretty ambivalent because I don't, I wouldn't, I don't, I try not to see myself as anti woke. Um, but I actually have, and I, I don't think many anti woke types or would be, admit this, but I've genuinely seen a, a rise in in racist um, and misogynistic and and general hateful content online, and um, because he has liberalised a lot of the um, the content moderation. And maybe this is too personal in the sense of maybe just my user experience of Twitter has just got worse um, and, and, and that I don't like that. And so I'm kind of sympathetic to, to like basically censoring some people. But what, I guess what is there like a middle ground where maybe it, it was too far the other direction before when um, anyone that basically just like said that sex is real was, was like removed from Twitter. But actually... In the context now, when we have social media, um, when we're, we're saturated with information, podcasts, commentary, um, that that have we lost a sense of standards? Have we lost that? That's not censorship as such, but a sense of um, duty, a sense of responsibility, a sense of moderation um, in your in in, your, in the way that you engage in public life. And I, I, I don't know what you think about this, but I, I worry that when liberal, some of the like free speech liberal um, doesn't really talk enough about how, what, what's right and what's good and, and what's the proper way to conduct yourself. Because even if you don't know, we, like even saying racist things, yes, that's free speech, but at the same time, you know, is that really the kind of, way in which you should be using your speech if that makes sense I, I i think when it comes to you know sort of free speech absolutism i i am still almost there i'm, I'm divided i'm i'm torn on on things like um you know things things like andam chowdhury and um because of the the number of young men who then went off and killed people uh you know so and, and his ban on 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 his him speaking his ideas i i think uh, mm, you know there's there's some some justification for that but when it comes to the way codes of conduct and and what is normal i mean i think this is 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 partly why we need to push back at both the new um the 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 backlash that 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 is coming that is now normalizing um the use of of misogynistic um racist homophobic language and this um these theories that that um that that this is all normal that that racism is normal it's ordinary it's it, it's permanent we need to deal with it it's very bad but you're not a bad person if you if you hold it and get back to we, we never properly achieved it but the the idea of a, of a detente where we have had a consensus that being racist makes you a bad person. It it lowers your um, respectability. It it lowers the esteem in other people's eyes. It will lose you, you friends. And uh, I I would like us to to regain 
um, that that what worries me is 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 that I see people say openly um, racist things seemingly without fear of of being thought to be a total asshole um, because they have enough other people who who agree with them. So when it comes to codes of conduct, I think in certain places, if, if you want to to say something, um, you know, some horrible a thing like. Um, you know, maybe the, the the Holocaust was was a good thing, and um, uh, you know uh, that black people are um, are inherently criminal and and unintelligent, and and women are um, un, are irrational and unfit to have any role in public society. If you want to to hold to say these views, then then have have your own spaces for them. If that if they they don't have a a place in in workplaces, for example. I think it, it's perfectly reasonable to have codes of conduct in for workplaces, and I think it's it's reasonable to have codes of conduct for social media um, and other sort of public forums which draw a line at being um, abusive, ver verbally abusive to people, if and particularly with with targeted harassment. You know, if you if you want to hold racist views, if you want to make an argument for the rightness of your racist views, then I would be against criminalising that. But if you try to make anybody else hear them, if if you try to harass any individual with them, um, if you expect um, other various platforms to 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 platform them. Then, then you, then you, you, you should not be in luck. Then that, that the, the, the idea of social acceptability, I, I, I think yes, we, we need to just get a very simple, um, con consensus that that being racist is is bad. It, it, it makes you a bad person. <laughs> no, I, I think you're so right, Helen. I just feel that. You know, I think those really basic, sensible conversations, I think, now need to be had. Like, we, we stand up for, we stand up for tolerance, stand up for freedom of speech. But at the same time, I think that, um, that there are right and proper ways to behave. That doesn't mean that people can't behave improper and behave in stupid ways. But I think that a certain level of standards in public life is not an, you know, it's not an unreasonable um, ask. And being able to, the, the frustration is that we're so polarised at the moment where it's just one or the other. And we, and we can't seem to get to that place. So I guess we, we've almost run out of time. I guess the final thing is, I, I'm very much looking forward to your next book, which I will be reading and we will be you know, publishing, publicising widely. Um, but I guess my final question is, what, what, what do you want people to take forward now? You know, three years on from cynical theories and obviously I think a couple years since uh, uh, Counterweight, which I, I know that you, you're no longer involved, but... Um, I guess there's been a lot of work that's been done by you and others in order to um, re-energise public debate, to promote liberal ideals and values and so on. What, what, where would you like to see the conversation go now? Well, I, I, I would first of all like people not to despair. Since I, mm. uh, the, the chapter that I've just, just finished looking at unconscious bias training, uh, because it got held up for a year and a half because I was unwell. Looking now, mm. I'm seeing a very positive change in a lot of equity, mm. diversity and inclusion programmes. They are stepping away from the essentialism that, um, you know, all white people are racist, all men, men are sex. They, they are having a more universal, you know, just don't be a dick message. And I, I'm seeing this as very positive development. But what I, I would like... People, if if when they are thinking um, that this that there, there needs to be action, there needs to be decisive action um, against um, the rise of of, um, of horrible ideas. Think about what what works to beat horrible ideas. Do, do, has censorship of them ever worked? Um, has um, trying to replace one authoritarian um, viewpoint with another ever worked? And I would encourage them to understand um, liberalism in a stronger way. It's it's not a, a laissez-faire, 
just just let everybody say whatever they want to then leave them alone thing it is a um you have the right to your beliefs as long as you are not hurting anybody else if you're in institutions you're 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 hurting other uh, other people if you're if you're um, abusing people if you're firing people you're hurting other people so having a real confidence in getting more strongly liberal not um not regarding it as a wishy-washy tolerant thing but a a really um strong push for preventing the um abuse and and denial of freedom to other people mm. that 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 was a little Hello, black rose. <laughs> oh no it wasn't at all it was fantastic Helen Cockrose, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, it's lovely to talk to you again, Anaya. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoy our videos, why not leave a like and hit the subscribe and notification bell so you make sure that you do not miss an episode.